Okay. It's nice to be here. And uh, in a way, what I'm going to talk is a continuation of what we heard in previous talks, so in a slightly different perspective, and that's always good, because then you can learn from, you can say the whole session and not only from my, my talk. So I'm going to talk about control of noisy gates and I can, you can use this. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, I'll talk about people who contribute to, to this work. And here's one of our organizers, Lisa's previous work. But I would say Habib Avok is here. And I would say these three people are the last contributors to the work that I'm talking about, or Idan, which was here two weeks ago. Shimshon Kalush, which is not here, in Aviv, which is here. These are my partners for this study. So, start from that. And, okay, so I don't have to tell you that, that all quantum systems are open. And so this is really the idea here. I have an ion trap or a superconducting qubit or whatever. So this is the world we we live in an open quantum system, and we have to address that. And so now we go to the issue of quantum controllability of open quantum system. And there is no good theory of complete controllability of quantum open system. But I would say the model that I'm going to use, I have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, I have the drift Hamiltonian, I have the control part. And if I think about unitary control, then the change in entropy is zero. So this is an important distinction. So for this case, we have good theorems about controllability of the system, but now I'm interested in systems that the entropy changes. In. So, and then I can think about two types of systems that I want to talk about. State to state control, I have an initial state going to a final state, and process control where I want to control basically the quantum gate. So the question we want to address, can we mitigate the controller noise by using optimal control theory? So here there are different types of optimal control of entropy changing state. You can say fast equilibration is one I'm not going to talk about. You can say laser cooling all comes under this uh, control task. And reset, Landau uh, eraser, quantum annealing. Again, I'm not going to talk about, and I'm mostly going to talk about non unitary gates and unitary gates under noise. So, this is, will be my control objectives that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so again, I don't have to teach this audience that control works on interference. And the agent of control is coherence. And once we have an open quantum system, our agent of control is degraded. So what can we do? So this is uh, what we have to do. If we want to do control, and I'm going to do it in a continuous way, not in a discrete way, what we need is an equation of motion. So this is the equation of motion I want to control. And I have a quantum gate. Here's my definition of the quantum gate. And my generator of the equation of motion will have the form. It's split into a unitary part and a dissipated part. And the unitary part has a drift Hamiltonian and a control Hamiltonian. Now, the dissipator part that comes from the open quantum system is going to degrade the ability to control. So it's good and bad. We'll see that you have to that's where our control comes. We want to take the good part out of the dissipator and avoid its harmful part of us. So this is the model. So I want to stress the model. The environment is not control. I'm only going to control the system. Okay, so now let's think about this dissipator. So you could say there, I took three types of dissipators. 
One is a type that the noise comes from the pulse generator. And I put it first because this is typically ignored. We assume we have complete control or have a unitary, but if you think about it, when I do an experiment, my controller has noise. So we can't avoid this noise. It's there, and it's if you think of the controller is typically fast, it's going to be Markovian noise. And I'm going to model it with this, this double commutator, which looks like that, which this is the controller Hamiltonian itself. So this is a model of a white Markovian noise on the controller itself. The second, you can say, noise comes from back action. We heard about that before. So if it's weak quantum measurement, we can sum this up again as a double commutator with the operator we're going to measure. This is, you can see, the dissipator that you get from back action. From, you can see weak quantum <laughs> measurement. And the third thing that I'm going to talk about is environmental noise. We have a system, a bath, and a system bath coupling. And so these two three types of noise, these are the types that I'm going to address. Okay, so now a few words about open system dynamics. I have a system it's coupled with the environment, and the system in general can change entropy. So this is uh, where we are, and now we need equations of motion for this, and we go to quantum thermodynamics, and here we're in the Einstein session, so I have here Einstein 1905. So in a way. Quantum thermodynamics comes between Carnot and Einstein. And Einstein 1905 paper is basically based on thermodynamic arguments. He looked at the, you can say, the uh, equation of uh, photons, the entropy of photons in a black box, and he figured out it's equivalent to the uh, entropy of free particles in a box, and then from that, he did the quantum jump and assumed, okay, photons are quantized. So this is, you could say, the birth of quantum mechanics. But in a way, now we do the reverse thing. We start from quantum mechanics and try to look at thermodynamic principles. So this is tools that I'm going to use, already been talked about. And so now, we want to insert dynamics into thermodynamics. So there are a few rules that I have to follow in order to do that. I start from a universe that's unitary. It's driven by a Hamiltonian. So we have this description. And what we're interested in is a reduced description of only my system. So we trace over the back, and we want to get it in a differential form. This is what we need in order to get equations for control. So here it is. I again split it up into a unitary part and a dissipated part. And then we can ask the question is a dissipated part independent of the unitary dynamic? And this is an important question because typically you would say, okay, they come from different sources, I can treat them separately. But in this setup, when I have an environment and I have my system in it, they're not independent. And one good reason for that, if I don't do that, I'm not consistent with thermodynamics. So our equations of motion are built to be consistent with thermodynamics. So we want a Markovian master equation. We know that the map has the Strauss form. We heard about it already today. And the general framework of a Markovian master equation is this Lindblad equation. But if you look at it by itself, what it assures us is conservation of probability or completely positive trace preserving map, but it doesn't build in thermodynamic constraints into this equation. So we have to add additional thermodynamic constraints, and we do that. So the simplest way, instead of deriving an equation, let's impose them. So the, our dynamical map is going to be Markovian. The environment is stationary. We we'll assume it has infinite heat capacity. It's, there is a fixed point of our map, which is a thermal state. 
So our map should lead us to thermal equilibrium. And this fourth term here is what's important. We want strict energy conservation. So what does it mean? That the interface with, between our system and environment doesn't accumulate energy. So it, uh, it can work in the weak coupling limit in one hand or in a scattering case it can work. So this is a thermodynamic constraint. And thermodynamic is natural because what we say, the interface is always small relative to the volume. Quantum mechanics are, can be controversial, but I'm going to use it anyway. So using this constraint, we can prove something very nice. If we have, you can say the total energy in the system is a conserved quantity. What does it mean? It means that if energy goes from here to here, the total energy is conserved. So any energy that's missing here goes to the back and vice versa. This is writing the symmetry statement. <laughs> I can bring it one beyond the say and say that the dissipated part and the unitary part have to commute in the sense of super operators. So this part has to commute with the Hamiltonian part. So what does it mean if two operators commute? They have a a common eigen, in this case, eigen operator set. So this allows us to get the Lindbergh jump operators, the eigen, eigen operators of the free dynamics. So this is a dynamical symmetry that I'm going to impose. And now we want to do control. So this dynamical symmetry is not uh, good enough because that was for stationary cases. So in order to understand uh, the control case, I embed everything in a large quantum system. So I have a system, a controller, system controller, interaction with the environment. So I have a setup that looks like that. And once I do that, I can play a very similar, you can say, idea. I can look for the reduced description, impose uh, Markovian conditions, and then for this, I want to get consistent time-dependent equations for my control. So here, this, you can say, I can put it in one large system. And then you can go through a series of approximations. And the first one, you can see that the, in the interaction representation has to commute with the three dynamics. This is the first one. And you could go to a semi-classical approximation and completely trace of the controller, and you get this condition that the dynamical map commutes with the free dynamics. But this free dynamics is, a, is explicitly time dependent. That's a time dependent that I impose on my system. So if I obey this condition, first of all, be consistent with thermodynamics. What does it mean? That if I have a driven system, I'm putting work into my system. So work can only be dissipated. So work can go from my controller into the environment, only one direction. This is second law of thermodynamics. The opposite can't happen. I can't get work out of the environment and you could say fuel up my control. So assuring these conditions tells you that the entropy generation is positive and essentially I obey the laws of thermodynamics. What does it mean practically? that the Lindblad jump operators of the system, I can get them out of this, basically this free dynamics. Now, this free dynamics is not that diabetic one because I can do non adiabatic jumps, but I can solve for this unitary and get that, and I'll show that. In. Okay, so out of all these considerations, I can get what's called the non-adiabatic master equation, which you can say looks like that. And the difference is that these Lindblad equations are explicitly time dependent. And you can say the jump operators are eigen operators of the free dynamics. This is how we get them. And we can get an instantaneous attractor 
because we're changing the rules of the game, we're changing the driving, so our tractor will also be changed. So now we have a way we can to get this equation. We can derive it typically from weak coupling limit, but we can also guess it in a way because we know the laws of thermodynamics and we can impose them and this is what we get. So now I'm going to use this for control. What I want <clears throat> just before that, if we have a fixed point, so you can say the distance between of my system with a fixed point determines the entropy generation. We just you can see this equation over here. And as expected, if I drive faster, I have to pay a price. So the faster I drive, I'm going to be more irreversible to entropy generation in the universe. So now let's go to quantum system and control. So I have equations of motion. This is the first thing I need for control. Now, here's my equation of motion. Here's my control Hamiltonian. This generates a unitary part. This is my control part. And again, going back, I can do state-to-state -state control or process control. These are the two objectives that they want to do. And now we can basically take the idea of optimal control theory, and I can put an objective. In this case, it's reaching a certain target operator. And so since it's linear algebra, this is very close to what people are used to in the Schrodinger picture. Just everything is kind of moved to density operators. And so you can see the constraints that we put the evolution is the Louisville von Neumann equation. The total field energy is minimized, and we get the total objective. So here's this constraint of obeying the Louisville von Neumann equation. Here's the constraint on minimizing the energy, total energy, and this is the target. So this we have done, say, more than 20 years ago. And what you find out that you'd have to add a Lagrange multiplier, and in this case, it becomes an operator Lagrange multiplier, this B. And when you solve the equations, you get a forward equation for the density operator and a backwards equation for the Lagrange multiplier, but the dissipation is always against you. So when you go backwards in time, also the dissipation works against you. And if you want to try to understand it, that comes from the dissipation is really at least second order in the interaction. So uh, it has, you can say, symmetric in time. So it's always against. So this you can do. So this is state to state control. But let's go further and let's do process control. So, in a way, I didn't invent anything, I just translated to another level in Hilbert space. So my vectors now are the uh, you can say the density operators, and the operators are the super operators. So here's my objective is to ob obtain here certain, so just before that, I work with a complete operator basis in Louisville space. So I have a, this, what's called Hilbert Schmidt in space. I have a gate that's defined like that. Under this basis, if I know how my target gate operates on all the operators in the basis, that defines the gate as a matrix. And I have a new type of ob uh, objective that this is the scalar product between what I get and what I want. And you can define it as this, the trace can be defined in this way under using a complete basis in operator space. So in a way, we generalize linear algebra. And then the equation of motion for the gate looks like that. And now you can say the constraints that I put, the equation of motion is one constraint, the Louisville von Neumann equation, and the total field energy is minimum. So this thing looks 
linear algebra very similar, except I moved everything up to Louisville space. And this looks simple, but the, the task is factorially more difficult with state to state. And we can try to understand why, because when I do state to state, I'm looking for a field that brings me from here to here. When I do process control, I want to find multiple solutions that each one is orthogonal that takes each one of my basis state to the final. So it's simultaneously end-to-end -end transformation instead of one. But each transformation has to be orthogonal to the rest. So that's why it's factorially more different. <clears throat> okay. So this is the equation that I have to solve. Now, I can say there is a difference when we talk about how to cal calculate the correction to the field. Here, this is my total constraint. And now I have to take the functional derivative of the Neuvillian with respect to the field. And I can have two terms. One is a usual term, the unitary term, which basically comes from my control operator V, which is this commutator that I have here. But the second term comes from the dissipator, and the dissipator is implicitly dependent on the control. So we have to calculate the, the, the derivative of the dissipator with respect to the field, and we do it like that, and we have to do, in this case, we're doing it numerically because we don't have an analytical way to figure this out, except in some cases. So, we put, we stick this into our numerator. This, uh, so now we have two terms we can play with, and Aviv is playing with how much we want to do dissipated control, how much unitary control. So this is still in progress. Okay. So now how does the algorithm work? We guess a control field. The control field allows us to calculate the free dynamics, and then we construct the consistent master equation. We calculate the evolution, this is for a state, and then we update, we calculate the objective and update the field. And we, we have used two types of control. One is using a modified crab algorithm, and the other one is using optimal control theory using a court of algorithm. So we use both methods. So let's here is a kind of a summary of this uh, control scheme. You can say you start, you get free dynamics, master equation, dissipative evolution, control objective, and then update until you control. Let's go to the scheme. So we did many gates. So this. Uh, is base is a single cubic Hadamar gate in this case, and it's under uh, thermal conditions. So here is a Hadamar gate looking in Louisville space. That's how it looked. We did also a reset gate, which is it's a non-unitary gate, and <clears throat> the idea is that you want to get as close as possible to your target. So in this case, the dissipation is against. So what I'm showing you is if we start in the Hadamal in X direction, we end out in minus Z. So this, you can see the first line, this red line, which goes on the block sphere, is the unitary solution that we guessed, first of all. And then we use this unitary, and just added dissipation without doing anything, and we added here. So what are the mistakes that we got? What are the errors? We got two types of errors. One is a unitary error. We didn't reach to the right place in the block sphere. And the other one, we reached this inner sphere. So you could say all this from this outer sphere to the inner sphere is loss of purity. So we have, you can see, dissipative errors and unitary errors. Now, if we use optimal control, we get this blue trajectory, which goes from here to here. And if you look at it, it's all the time very close to the surface of the block sphere. So we keep the purity while 
we, when we find this solution. So <clears throat> this is uh, just one example. Uh, here's the Hadamard gate. So if we try to analyze it from a thermodynamic point of view, we see it's active cooling. There's tremendous amount of dissipation going on. So there's a lot of power invested in that. All this power is dissipated in the bath, but it keeps our system cooling. So it's not, you could say, looking for decoherence free subspace like Birgitta once taught us. It's a different type of solution. Very dissipated. So it's active cooling while it's working. Okay, so we could do a two uh, qubit entangling gate with less fidelity, but we can do that. But I want to go to the subject here, which is controller noise. So here's our model. I have a H0 drift Hamiltonian with some control. Now, this function here has noise. So we model this noise as stochastic, you can say white noise, delta correlated. And once we do that, immediately we can get the master equation, which is this double commutator. So now there are two types of noise we can think about the controller. One is amplitude noise, which means here's my step function of a controller that I, I want to do this line, the red line, but I don't get the amplitude right, so I fluctuate around the red line like that. And the other type of noise is timing errors. I have a, you can say the time that it does is not, doesn't follow. So I have small time steps, larger time steps, or fluctuations in time step. So fluctuation in time step is like fluctuations in frequency. It's equivalent because what matters is the action. Um, this type of noise gives me another double commutator, in this case with the Hamiltonian itself. So this is phase noise and amplitude noise, a double commutator with, is with a controller. And you can get the scaling, the fidelity for amplitude noise should look as a variance of this variable. And fidelity for phase noise, this is a recent experiment which has this scale, or at least for a few. So these are the types of noise we studied with a beep. And again, we can look at the block sphere. So here is phase noise. So I want to reach again to this point here. We start from here to this minus x at this point here. And you can see that without, here I did, don't see, I didn't show the, the yeah, there are three. So yes, there's control. So you can say without control, the unitary will reach to the this point. Without control, I go to an inner sphere. In this case, I lose two percent of fidelity. I reach about ninety-eight percent. But if I put the control, I can restore the fidelity back. But the solution is different. You can see it doesn't follow the unitary. So the solution is different. So this kind of tells us something. There are two types of uh, corrections you can think about how I find one, that out of all unitaries, I find the unitary that's most immune to noise. This is one possibility. And what we find out that this is not the case, that to fight control, we have a different unitary solution or a different driving. If I take the noise out and I ask, will it reach to the objective, it won't. It will reach to, we'll have a unitary mistake. So you can say this unitary part is compensates with the dissipation and leads us back to where we want to go. So then here's the people of control like to look at the field. Here how this field looks like. This is the unitary. Here the corrections are typically here. Now the corrections are very small. And here's an important point. The errors we're talking about are very small. We're talking about fidelities of, a, let's say, between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 6. 
we want to go get really good quantum dates, uh, gates. So the corrections are tiny. So we work extremely hard on our numerics. We have, I would say, accuracy that is much exceeds the fidelity. So we have a very good propagator of the Ludwig von Neumann equation. And if we want to reach accuracy of eight digits, we can do that. So our results, because otherwise your if your numerics are not good, you can't really fix anything in, when you talk about high fidelity. So <clears throat> we can see this is noise reduction per qubit. It's not too much. You can and you can as you increase the noise, your ability to correct is not very uh, big. And but if you add an ancilla, yeah. which I think is a is a good idea. So you have a, a qubit and it's added to an ancilla that, and everything is connect, connected to the bath. And then you do the control on the qubit, you can do much better. And what it means is that you move population to the ancilla. Basically, you kind of move the dissipation to your ancilla and then you move the population back because you don't want to populate it. It's just sitting there initially. You populate it temporarily and then you go back and you can improve your fidelity. So this is one idea. And then we can do two qubit gates with this idea. And you can see optimal control theory can improve a gate a great deal. And this is sometimes it can improve the solution more than we started. If we look at this point here, a very small noise, we find out that adding noise, we get a better solution. Why is that? It in a way, opens new avenues for our open uh, control so we can get a better so here. This means better solution, and then it degrades as expected when we increase the noise. So we can see we can increase the fidelity by orders of magnitude in this case. In this okay, so I think I can uh, conclude my uh, story here that the dissipate, this is, I would say, the main point. The dissipative and the unitary generators are linked. We can't expect that if we add the unitary part, it won't change the dissipation. So sometimes maybe we can have some, if we can add white noise, that's, you can beat, you can say the thermal bath. So that's adding another noise term, that's possible. But in general, these things have to be linked and we could use this to our, our advantage. So the free dynamics determines a dissipator and we, we control the free dynamics Indirectly, we modify the dissipation, and that allows us more ability to control. As I showed you, we can get controls we couldn't get otherwise. Now, the trouble about optimal control theory that after you get a solution, you have to think, okay, what did I have in my hand? What did I get? What did I learn from? If it's a numerical procedure. So you have to go back and try to analyze. So we can do fast reset. So the idea, I didn't talk about that, but the idea, you can understand it like that. I want to reset my system as fast as possible. So how do you do that? You want to stay as far as possible from equilibrium when you're connected to the bath, because when you're close, your relaxation is very slow. So the relaxation goal is a distance from equilibrium. So how do you achieve that? You start generating a lot of coherence. If I have coherence, I'm always far from equilibrium. So I'm going to relax fast, but in the, la in the last moment before I want to, I get rid of the coherence, I translate coherence back to population and I can get a fast reset. So if I want to equilibrate fast, I start on the energy, you can say, uh, frame. I generate coherence, I relax fast. When the right moment, when I dissipated the right amount of entropy, I go back and I can do things fast as possible, and we call that shortcut to equilibration. Like, so <laughs> you can short that. So this is 
one mechanism. The other one I talked about is active cooling while performing unitary tasks. So if I want my unitary to work, I have to cool simultaneously. And the way it's done, and we can show that, that there's a lot of power involved. So I put a lot of power into my controller. Now this power is channeled in such a way that it cools, you can say what the actively cools a qubit or the two qubits or whatever my quantum system and dissipates. So the entropy generation is very large. And if you're willing to pay this price, that means you can keep your, actively keep your uh, system. Okay. So I think it's this. Here are some recent papers that we worked on, and I think. Thank you. Do we have some scientific questions for Ronnie? Thank you, Professor Kozlov, for your nice talk. <clears throat> I'm trying to understand when we talk about thermodynamics, we have to think about uh, many particles, an Avogadro number, and all in this case, we can also define temperature and we have entropy. So I don't see, I, it's difficult for me to see how you can use the, say, Liouville von Neumann picture uh, in this case, because your density matrix is very large. So how practically we can do statistical mechanics in this case? Okay, so so the, the, whole, the whole point of, uh, you could say, quantum thermodynamics was, as we heard, is how far can we miniaturize? How can, far can we take the concepts from, you can say, the macroscopic system to the microscopic? The, the, the surprising answer that we can take them to a single uh, quantum entity. So you can say a single. So, 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 I would say the temperature is defined on my, uh, by the environment, and the reason is that the environment has in, the assumption here that I built in is the environment has infinite heat capacity. So, if I transfer energy, the temperature is constant in the environment. But the system, I don't define through a temperature, but I can define a density operator, and I can define entropy of the system of the reduced system, and then. So all these concepts hold, and I can calculate observables of the system. So if I look at the heat engine, everything is defined through the observables of my system. And the assumption is that the environment is large and stationary. Now, you can break these assumptions, make a smaller environment, and so on, but you can say the basic, what I used here is a large environment. Now, if this fits, let's say I think about my quantum computer, an IBM machine or whatever. So if you look at it, it looks quite awful because you have a big barrel, meter squared, and you have a chip that's this size, which is ac your actual quantum computer. And you have all this uh, helium sitting there, which means it has practically infinite heat capacity. The other point which makes the theory work there, that it's weak coupling because the experimentalist worked very hard to make it weak coupling to the environment. So I could use the theory that I use. If it's not weak coupling, or maybe I should use something else. But 
the theory that I use is appropriate, you could see, for modern quantum devices. Um, so I, I, I would like to challenge what you said that you're not in a decoherence free subspace and you do active cooling is probably that you are in a dynamical decoherence free subspace by active cooling. But I think the more interesting question is um, how are you cooling? So, so how do you make sure that uh, the way you drive will lead to cooling and not to heating? Have you looked at this in the analysis of your control solution? It's a challenge, and we don't know. The, the, the truth is we don't know uh, how it works. We know it's cooling, because I can calculate the entropy production. I have a, a different uh, study that we know in a, that's also active cooling. We try to do what's called tracking in an open environment. And again, we found that in order to track, so the idea was tracking, you take a unitary trajectory of your system, and you try to find the control that tracks that. So we do that by local control. And again, we found that it works by active cooling. So I, I think the, the controller chose a solution that does that. But more than that, I don't know. Hey, uh, so my question is related to the point before you made about the Markovian approximation. Because typically in quantum devices, that is a pretty bad approximation. We have no idea really what's going on, right? So, so my question is, if you would go beyond that, so if you include non-Markovian effects, for example, what would happen? Okay, so uh, the answer is, the, the question what I what I put into the into non Markovian uh, description. So you could say there there's a practical approach to non Markovian description, and and that is to embed it in a larger system. So basically move my system path coupling one layer beyond. This is something that Christian has used, and I would say that's quite an effective way. For example, if I if I add an ancilla to my system, I made it non Markovian because I enlarged my Hamilton. So this is, you can say, one answer. I, the price I pay, I, I increase my Hilbert space. Yeah, but that's, I would say that's one solution. And there's another solution which says, okay, let's look at my master equation. And can, can I extend it to, uh, you can say, non-Markovian uh, conditions? And we did that. And, but what we did, we said, okay, I want a master equation. And the master equation puts mathematical restrictions on my Louisvillian. It means that my map has an inverse. Otherwise, you can't define a master equation. So let's say the conditions are such that I have a master equation. And then you ask, okay, how does my non-Markovian Louisvillian look like? And the answer, it looks the same. It looks like the same structure as I showed you the time-dependent, you can say, Lindblad uh, generator, but with caveats that you can say the non-Markovianity is built into the kinetic coefficient. So this can be rigorously correct, and the reason is this is linear algebra. I was initially surprised, but then I realized, okay, even the Lindblad equation looks funny, it's still a linear operator. So you can embed non-Markovian dynamics in the same structure as the Lindblad equation. What, what it involves is calculating bath correlation functions to high order, which is not a trivial task. And the prices, which is not up anyway, my uh, equation is time dependent, so from the point of view of, of solving it, it will cost the same. No, this is what we did. We be, because the, the thermodynamics uh, constraints put the same structure. So before we end, I, I have a question for you. Sure. What is this machine we're looking at? This. Is, is a track. 
Western tea. We used to, that's how we, we used to get our meat, let's say 100 years ago, our meat and wheat from Argentina. So it's a steam tractor. All right. Let's thank our speaker again.